In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. For more than 20 years, God has used Bill and Annabelle Gillum to help people understand and appropriate the truths of Galatians 2.20. Through their tapes, books, seminars, and nationwide radio program, thousands of people have found freedom and fulfillment as they have learned how to let Christ live in and through them. Now just imagine allowing God himself to express his life through you in your family, your work, and everywhere you go. Join Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum and discover why Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. At the beginning of this session, we want you all to do something for us. On a scale of 1 to 10, we want you to choose a number that will communicate what you think about yourself, with one being very negative, being low, and with 10 being positive, being high. And that should be just for you to see, nobody else. Now then, the session that you are going to be seeing now is probably the most important session that you're going to be viewing. And I am so excited for you to hear as Bill teaches. Well, in our last... Uh time together where I was lecturing, we were talking about the flesh, not a real pretty topic, and, um, but I've got some really good news for you. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Boy, this is a liberating verse. This is the New American Standard that I'm using, translation. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh. Now, is that good news or what? Because see, that number that you put down on your paper when, when we first began to lecture, that numeral in all probability is your assessment of your fleshly identity. And God says, hey, can it? I have swept that thing out. That is not the way I'm looking at you. That's really not who you are. I'm looking at your spirit. The very, very next verse says so. Look at verse 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new spirit critter. Now, what does he say happened to all the old garbage? Old things have what? Passed, Passed away. away, man. They're history. See that? And how about your future? Look, new things have come. That's you. You're the new kid now. <laughs> So what we've got to do is get into God's Word and see how he pulled this off, first of all. And then secondly, we've got to find out who you are as this new kid. And it isn't just rows of black print on white paper. It's reality, gang. This is who you really are. We're talking Monday morning Christianity, man. This stuff works in the marketplace and in your house and with your kids and everywhere you want to take it because it's going to be Christ living through you as who you are in him. Woo, heavy stuff. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> well, Lord, again, we're just trusting you for this, and um, you're the only one that can teach it to us, and we call on you and trust you by faith that you're going to work through Annabelle and me, and you're going to work within my brothers and sisters and turn some lights on for them, and uh, we're all going to go out of here saying, wow, this is really amazing. And it will be because it'll be God. Okay, now then, God, the scriptures say that God created all things. All things were created by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, does that cover everything from acorns to the solar system? That covers it, doesn't it? That means there's no such thing as a natural phenomenon, something that just is. No such thing as that. If it is in its natural state, how did it get there? God did that. All right? So that includes the time dimension. 
Time is a creation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did it for his own purposes. Why? Because you can't have faith outside of a time dimension. You got it. First of all, you got to believe, and then tick, 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 and then it comes into reality. Oh, yeah, I see that. You see how that's got to work now? If there weren't any time dimension, then faith couldn't operate. And someday, time will be no more because we won't need faith, right? Okay. So God created all things, including the time dimension. Now, that means then that God can't be time dimensional because if God were time dimensional, he'd be controlled by his own creation, the time dimension. That can't be true. Therefore, God is always present tense. He is in the present tense rather than a time dimensional being. Now then, <clears throat> you are a time dimensional being. So let's draw a timeline here with B for birth at the beginning and D for death over here at the ending. Now, this represents your earth walk. And let's pretend that every episode in your earth walk is represented by, um, well, it's, your, your earth walk is represented like the main street of an old western movie set, okay? With the storefront facade, you know, the saloon and the barbershop and all that kind of stuff. All right, every episode in your life is going to be represented by a little storefront on this main street. So here we have H for haircut, the day you got your first haircut. Little bitty stuff like that. And then the biggie stuff. Here we have S for salvation, the day that you came under conviction by the Lord. You repented of your sins, and you claimed Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and bingo, you got saved there. Now, the T then represents today. From T backward is what you call the past because you're a time critter. T, you call the present because you're a time critter. From T forward is what you call the future because you're a time critter. But God is not like you at all in this respect. God is like a man in a helicopter up here who's hovering over your timeline. And these lines here streaking down from God represent his line of sight. It's all present tense for him. Now that leaves God the freedom to see your entire lifeline and know all of your decisions before you make them. But it also leaves you free, completely free, to, let's say, make 16 choices between now and the end of this lecture. You are a free moral agent. But there's one thing God never says, and that is, well, I never thought of that. God, you cannot shock him. You can't surprise him because he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. And by definition, he then can't be time-dimensional. Now, let's see if you, see you process this one. Uh, look at the right-hand vector here indicating God's sight line to the end of time. God sees forever into what you call the future. This is how he can write the Revelation and all these other prophecies, and never miss a lick, because it's all present tense from the helicopter. <clears throat> now, if you can process that one, here's one that'll make your computer go tilt. Look at the one on the left. His sight line from the left back to time begins. He can still see forever into what you call past. Is that wild or what? Now, <clears throat> let's look at the next diagram. This one represents the life of Jesus Christ. And you notice I have put an arrow tip here on the left end of Christ's lifeline indicating that his life goes forever into the past and an arrow tip on the right hand end of the lifeline indicating that his life goes forever into the future. And then there is a dip here where he came down to planet Earth and kind of paralleled your lifeline for 33 years. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to call your attention to the cross there in Christ's lifeline. The scriptures say Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. In some strange way, gang, Christ was crucified 
from the helicopter viewpoint outside the time dimension. Now, I don't understand this. I'm just explaining it to you. Okay? <laughs> Look, this represents a, an essential to the way God operates. He never allows a problem to come into your life but what he has already provided the solution for it. And God spells relief, J-E-S-U-S. Something that that man, some facet of what that God man accomplished at the cross is invariably the solution to the problem that you have. Okay? The trick is understanding how so you can appropriate it by faith. And that's what we're going to be discussing here tonight. Okay, now then, let's bring Adam into the picture. Now, Adam was the first Lord of the Ring, as we explained in an earlier lecture. And so what he did was he took over, and playing God, he determined that he would decide what's right and what's wrong for himself. And when he did, he died. And God said, if you do that, Adam, the day you eat of that tree, you'll die. He didn't say you'll die 900 years from now. He said, you eat of that tree in mid-afternoon, you're going to die by sundown. And that guy died, and he died spiritually, okay? Now, he passed these spiritual characteristics then on to all of his progeny. And all of us then got this spiritual inheritance from Adam. Now, I want us to look, and I'm going to put a wiggly green line stretching from Adam up here under his chin, and we'll have that going horizontally over toward your lifeline, where we're going to have you born here in a minute. And that's going to represent the spiritual characteristics that you inherited from Adam. So let's just mention a few of them. You were a sinner man. You were an enemy of God. You were without hope. Spiritually deaf, spiritually blind, lost, guilty, condemned, doomed. Bad news city, right? Now, gang, I want you to notice a critically important part here. Birth determines identity. Let's put you in there. Over B for birth, we'll draw another man right there. And when you were born, you automatically inherited all of these spiritual characteristics from Adam, as well as his physical characteristics, arms, legs, and so forth. Now, birth determines your identity always. Performance does not determine identity. A donkey is not a donkey because it hee-haws. You can do that. That'll make you a donkey. A donkey is a donkey because it was born a donkey. When you were born, your parents didn't hover over you and say, Oh, God, oh, God, please let him grow up to be human. <laughs> Maybe with one of you. <laughs> okay. Okay. You were born a human. You didn't have to do anything at all to become human. Just show up, man, and you were a human. Now then, gang, that's where you get this spiritual identity. Now, look. All you have to do to go to hell is just show up on earth. That's it. Just show up and live till you get old enough to appropriate God's provision for a safety net, Jesus Christ, and ignore that, and you're on your way to hell. You're accountable, okay? So your S-I-N-S do not send you to hell. Your nature sends you to hell. And all the good performance in the world that you can perform to try to change that nature is not going to work because birth determines identity, not performance. Okay, now let's look on over to the next diagram. And over here is, we'll depict you walking along on planet Earth, carrying along your old spiritual heritage <laughs> until finally you get to this S on your lifeline which represents salvation, where you came under conviction from the Lord, you repented of who you were and what you'd been doing, you invited Christ to come in and save you from yourself, and he did, and he changed you from the inside out. Isn't that great? You now have instantly become heavenly and godly 
as a result of your new creation in Christ Jesus. So, when you got saved then, you moved here into Christ's lifeline, and you got a new present. Now, all of you would agree with that, right? When you got saved, you got a new present. And all of you agree and believe that you got a new future, right? But what a lot of people don't seem to understand is that you got a new past as well. Your heritage from Adam is history. God had to erase that before he could give you your new identity. Had he not erased it, then you would have two identities. You'd have a dual identity in there. And there'd be, it'd be extremely difficult for you to figure out exactly who you are. Remembering now that birth determines identity. Now, gang, God had no plan for making something beautiful of your life. Like the song says, I'm sorry, but he had no plan for that. <clears throat> How are you going to make something beautiful out of a Lord of the Rings? See, the plan is kill it and start over. <laughs> cause this guy, first of all, cause him to die in Christ and then cause him to be reborn as a brand new spirit critter in the last Adam. The word Adam means man, okay? Christ is referred to as the last Adam. So there just really are two men that matter on planet Earth the first Adam and whether you've got his spiritual characteristics, or the last Adam and whether you've got his spiritual characteristics. And if you're in Christ, then you have got the spiritual characteristics that have been handed to you on a silver platter by your rebirth in the last Adam. Is that wild or what? I got a friend named Jay Kessler says, this, this is so unbelievable, only God would attempt to foist this, this kind of thing on us. <laughs> and that's really true. It's just unbelievable, man. All right, now, salvation is like a coin. It's got a head side and a tail side. Now, heads is Christ in you. <clears throat> tail side is you in Christ. Those are completely different now, gang. All right? Now, it's a package deal. You can't get one without the other one. It's like me marrying Annabelle. I can't marry Annabelle unless she marries me back. All right? Here again. Heads, Christ in you. Tails, you are in Christ. Now, many years ago, I counted all the verses that talk about Christ being in me. And then I counted all the verses that talk about being in Christ, in him, in whom, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ. And I found out that for every verse that is a head verse, Christ in me, there are 10 verses that are tails verses, me in Christ, a 10 to 1 ratio. And yet at that time, I had heard thousands of messages from well-meaning, godly Bible teachers about the heads verses, Christ in me. I don't remember having heard any good, solid messages on what it means to be in Christ. And yet here's God's Word loaded with it on a 10 to 1 ratio over the heads verses. Now, I'm not negating or denigrating the Christ in me verses. I'm simply saying if God has weighted His Word 10 to 1, with you in Christ, should it, would a wise Christian get into the Word of God and find out, sir, what in the world does it mean to be in Christ? I think so. That's the answer, gang, to your flesh. This is how he recreated you and why he no longer considers you according to the flesh. This is how he recreated you into a new spirit creator. It was through your being in Christ Jesus. Your life then goes forever into the past because your life is now Christ. He is your life. Now, it's your personality, ma'am, and your earth suit, and it's a pretty one, and your spirit, but Christ is now your life. You don't have a Lord of the Ring life anymore. You can act like you do, but you really don't. 
So if you want to walk in reality, you'll cut out this stuff of trying to play Lord of the Rings. Okay, now then, here's how God did it. I want to ask you a question. How many of your sins did Jesus Christ take to the cross 2,000 years ago? Answer, all of them. Question, how many of your sins had you committed 2,000 years ago? Answer, none of them. How are you going to figure that one out? Answer, helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Surely God turned somebody's lights on right there. The helicopter, that's how you answer that. From the helicopter view, you see, all of your sins were present tense and laid on Jesus at the cross. All right? People, we've got to think as Christians. Don't be afraid to challenge God and say, Sir, I really do want to understand this. Would you please give me an understanding of what this means? And he, if you're serious about it and you mean to life it out, you mean to apply it to bring honor to Christ, he will show you, he'll give you understanding. We call that revelation, don't we? He'll give it to you out of the Word of God or he'll just turn your lights on in the shower and let you understand. I get lots of understanding in the shower yeah, or mowing the lawn or something. He'll just, he'll just give you this understanding. All right? Now then, in Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 2, I'm going to give you just some excerpts from Romans 6, beginning with verse 2. Verse 2 says, we died to sin. We're going to prove now that you died in Christ, okay? God's plan for getting rid of who you were, your old identity, is to let you be executed in Christ. Verse 3, we have been baptized into his death. Verse 4, we have been buried with him. Verse 5, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Verse 6, our old self was crucified with him. Now, gang, look at the verb tenses in all these verses that I'm reading. Is this something that's going to happen in the future, or is this a done deal? It's a done deal. This has already taken place. You don't have to do anything to make this happen. You've got to claim by faith that this is reality, just like you claim by faith that Jesus took all your sins to the cross 2,000 years ago. See that? Only he took you to the cross 2,000 years ago. Verse 7, he who has died is freed from sin. Verse 8, if we have died with Christ, and we could keep on going, gang, but we don't have to beat this thing to death, right? Something died about you. Now, what was it? It was the, what the Bible calls the old man, the old guy, your old identity, who you were in Adam. This loser, this Lord of the Ring, this enemy of God, you died. That's how God started the process of solving your problem. Now then, what he's got to do is rebirth you as a brand new kind of person. You're different from Adam. Adam never had God living inside of him, but you do. That's why there's no more holy of holies in the temple anymore. You're the holy of holies. He's living inside you now. Wow! <laughs> now, before he could move in, he had to clean it out. So your temple would be holy, and you are holy now. This is what the scriptures say. Okay. So God says then that you are now holy, you're saint, okay? You're ho saint means holy. Fifty-six times after the cross, uh, the, God, the Word of God refers to you as a saint. You don't see Paul writing to all the sinners saved by grace at Corinth. Mm -hmm. And if, any, if you ought to write to any bunch of that, that's who you ought to write to. No, he doesn't say that. He says to all the saints at Corinth. There's no such thing as a sinner saved by grace any more than there's a married single person. <laughs> you are a saint who sins now. Before that, you were a sinner who sins. But you got changed. All right? Now then, you are God's son slash daughter. You are righteous. Now, what's that mean? It means you're all right with God. You're okay. It means you are acceptable 
to God. Not only are you accepted, Tommy, you're acceptable. A, a process took place in you, gang. A metamorphosis took place in you. And you came out acceptable to God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Is that mind-blowing or what? All of my life, what was I searching for? Why did I have the big chain around my neck? What was driving me? My need for acceptance, and I couldn't do it because I wasn't manly enough. Right? Do you see now that I've got my problem solved, but I've got to hold a good funeral to trying to live this other way and trying to constantly fight that battle to bestow love upon myself. And I've got to say, ah, oh, the battles are over. I made it. Thank you, God. Thank you. And not only has he accepted me, but I'm acceptable as a new male spirit critter in Christ. Is that great? Now, look, many Christians just don't believe this. But now listen, the scriptures say that there were two thieves crucified with Christ, right? You all believe that, don't you? But I'm here to tell you, I believe a lot of us believe that because the, it's cultural to believe it. We've, we've seen the Easter pageant. We've seen the three crosses ever since you've been little kids. We've seen that. And so, yeah, oh yeah, the, 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 the other two are before the thieves died. But I'm here to tell you that this Word of God has a whole lot more ink in it about the fact that you got crucified with Christ than it does about those two guys getting crucified with Christ. And well-meaning theologians have come up with ways of explaining that away. Because, brother, it just seems so, it seems like, it does not seem to me like the old man has been crucified, does it you? I, I, it seems like to me he's still alive and well in there, man. How about you, ma'am? Don't you have a war going on in there? I do, too. Well, it sure does seem to me like I've got a civil war going on in there. The good me, bad, fighting against the bad me. But God's Word says that is not the case. You cannot take this Bible and go verse by verse in Romans and come up with a live and kicking old man. That guy's dead in a hammer. He's history. <laughs> That's who died <laughs> in Christ. Okay? What you do come up with is something else that is called sin. And we're going to be discussing that as we go on through um, the lecture here. Not this lecture, but another one. Now, gang, let me say something. Annabelle and I are slick talkers. And we came in from out of town. That counts five points because you don't know us, you know. You don't know, <laughs> you don't know whether we're charlatans or not. We're slick talkers. And you have got to be leery of Christian slick talkers. You've got to be skeptical. You've got to test teachers. Even your pastor, you've got to test him continually. This is not a criticism. This is just being wise. You've got to test me against the Word of God and the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. All right, now then, you have a sheet now called My True Identity, and I don't want you to get it out now, but this is more homework for you. Next week, before you come back, I want you to study out that sheet. What I've done is I've just taken just a very few verses that talk about in Christ, in Him, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the verb tenses, and they're all past tense. It's a done deal. And we're going to look at, look at the descriptive phrases that describe any man who is in Christ. And we're going to find God saying that you are righteous, holy, blameless, forgiven, accepted, by him, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. So, as you trace then Christ's lifeline backward from when you got saved, you run into the cross. And so when he went to the cross, where were you? You were in him. And when he died, where were you? You were in him. When he was buried, what happened to you? You were buried. You were dead in a hammer in Christ. And when he was raised, you exploded forth in him 
as this righteous new saint of God in his resurrection. Whoa! Baptism is a one-act pantomime play, is what it is. And, and I just long to see water baptism handled like that, where somebody says to this guy before he goes under, okay now George, now when I put you under, this means that this is a picture of you going under the water and you're dying, man. And, and everything God could in the stomach about you, he's going to leave down at the bottom of that, that tub. And then when I raise you up out of here, I want you to picture yourself just exploding up out of this water as a righteous, new, glowing saint of God in Christ, filled with God himself. That's exciting to me. So, you and I then are these new spirit critters in Christ. Now, in addition to this, you have a new life. Now, your new life is a person, Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is life now to you. So he's more than your Savior and your Lord. He's your life, Duncan. And you were asking a question a little earlier about how can you handle this thing of, of being critical and so forth in your family, just like me. What if, what if you could somehow understand how to turn this life loose through you by faith? Uh, Christ living through you in your family. What kind of a husband would this woman have if I could somehow begin to do a pretty fair job of letting Christ live through me in my home? She would begin to see, by George, I thank God for this man. I thank God that I've got a husband like this. That's what's happening in our marriage, guys and gals. And people don't hear me saying that I never blow it. I blow it, man. I don't, I don't bring Christ online as life. And when that happens, the, the flesh is always right there, ready to, to come online, and the, and the wrong things come, come out of my mouth. Now, when that happens, I just repent and start over again and bring Christ back online. You do this moment by moment as you go through life. Okay? So, God then has solved your identity problem. You are now completely accepted by God. And God has solved your performance problem. You now have a, you have a, a person living in you who can express the Christian life through you to clean up your act. And so God has really solved all your problems for you. Now then, I want to ask you something. Think about that number that you wrote down there when we were talking about, give yourself a number that represents your self-esteem, how, you, how much you like yourself. Remember that number you put down? All right. God now, in terms of accepting you, he grades pass-fail. If you're in Christ, you pass. He doesn't grade on a 1 to 10 scale. If you're not in Christ, you flunk. So you might say that you're, if you're in Christ, then you're a 10. All right? So you're all 10s if you're in Christ. Now compare your number that you've put down on the paper to the number that God gives you, 10. Now let's say somebody in here gave himself a 7. And I think I'm being charitable with some of you. <laughs> Do you know why you gave yourself a seven? You rated yourself according to your performance and what you thought was your identity, how you feel, and how you look. That's how you rated yourself. And according to those criteria, you said, I've still got three more steps to go. If I could just look more like John Wayne, not you women, if I could just look more like John Wayne, then, then I could move to an eight. But God just didn't look with favor on me, and here I wound up with an earth suit that's only 5'10". You know, I just never, I just am not manly enough. Do you see that? That God has already given you a 10. Now listen, here's the kicker. You've got higher standards than God's got for accepting yourself. God's already accepted you. 
because he accepts you by one criterion only, what you've done with the finished work of Christ. What a God we have. But gang, you can believe all these things, walk out of here, and they'll do you absolutely no good whatever, unless you act on them. I've got a son that believes in marriage, but he's single. So what good's it doing him to believe in marriage? He's got to get him a woman. You have got to grit your teeth and commit to these truths and then begin to act like they're true in your life. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't encourage you to pray a prayer and commit right here and now to what you've seen. Now, my first prayer I'm going to pray is for the person who's here, and you don't really know Jesus Christ. You've never really invited him to come into you and change you from the inside out. So as I pray orally, you identify with this prayer silently. Here we go. Lord Jesus, I'm a Lord of the ring. I run my life. I do what I want to do. And God, I don't want to live like that anymore. So right now, sir, I get out of the chair. I get off the throne. And you sit down on the throne, Jesus. You run things. You are my God from here out. Change me, sir. Change me from the inside out. Now, God, I mean this. I've got my teeth gritted. I mean it. Thank you, God. And now my second prayer is for the person who prayed that first prayer with me, as well as those of you who are already Christians. And let's call this a selfers prayer. And this means that you've been trusting in your own flesh. You've been living your life. You've been trusting in your own talents, your own abilities, and so forth, instead of allowing Christ to express his life through you. And I know you don't understand all of this. I don't either. But you're going to commit to it. You want to commit to it. The Holy Spirit's touched your heart. So I'm going to pray this prayer, and you identify with me. Here we go. Lord Jesus... Like Bill said, I don't understand all of it, sir. I, I doubt if Bill understands it either. But I understand this much, that when you were crucified, I was crucified. And when you were buried, I was buried. And then when you arose from the grave, I was born anew. I exploded out of that grave as a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. And I am now righteous and holy and blameless and forgiven and completely and totally acceptable to you. God, what wonderful, marvelous truth. And then, Lord, I'm equipped with Jesus Christ in me to live the abundant life through me, to do the will of God here on planet Earth. So right now, Jesus, I surrender to all of this. You take over. You express your life through me and do your will through me. And again, God, I mean this, sir. I know I'm going to blow it some, but when I do, by your grace, I'll get up and begin again. Thank you, God. Thank you, sir. In Jesus' name.